Thank you, Michael. Thank you, CUC Ulster. Thanks to all of you for coming. It's great to see you here this evening. And I want to uh, take Rodri up on that very inspiring talk about how to reach this next generation. I want to interact with you. How many of you want to hear my presentation? Let's get a show of hands right now. They're going to vote. Hey, Rodri, check it out, man. Oh, you're voting twice. As a Chicago election commissioner, I appreciate that a lot. I don't know if that, uh, anyway, folks, um, I'm not going to have a lot of video in my talk. I'm going to be talking to you from here to there, maybe with a couple of interactive questions along the way about something that we, uh, we oh, we got to get rid of that. Hold on. All right. My question is, whose future as our history? And you say, what the heck? What's he saying? And this comes from a book, which I left over at the table, but maybe Myrna will hold it up. Just if you could hold it up. Here's the book. It's, it's, it's called The Future as History. Thank you very much, Myrna, for that interactive element. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So um, The Future as History was a book by Robert Heilbrotter in which he started to pull apart or, as we say, slice the onion on change. We're about the new. Our conversation here tonight is about the new, whether it's the new in reaching uh, Generation Z sports viewers, or we're going to hear about the new with AI from Myrna. Gene is going to talk about the new in his extraordinary elements. Doctor, who is coming after me, is going to talk about the new in some technology areas. And I'm going to talk about actually the process, how we as people work together to get to the new, okay? And it's always important to keep an eye on how we do these things and then to have a sense of our individual role and our process for creating something that is valuable and new. And of course, you go through questions like that. Who's, who is doing it? Who is making the new? You know, we sit here and we think, oh, well, maybe the new is being made in Seattle at Microsoft, or maybe it's being made, you know, in uh, Beijing or in Hong Kong at a financial center. Maybe that's where the new is. But I think we're going to hear tonight that there is a dispersal of the new so that all of us are really participating now in a way that we may not have even just a few years ago because of the technological capabilities that we have. I'm, I'm going to talk about three areas. They give us this red dot, which is a lovely red dot. And I'm going to talk about the present, the past, and the new or the future. Okay. And this, this is a little bit about what Heilbronner came up with. His insight in the, in the 50s, he wrote some articles in 59 and then he wrote the book in 60 or he published the book in 60. His insight was that when you're talking about the future, you've got sort of an ideal future and you've got a more realistic future. That's very important. So you've got two. So over here in the future, you've got the ideal future and you've got the realistic future. And back here in the present, people are thinking about both. They're thinking about the ideal and they're thinking about the real. But their concepts about that, of course, come from yesterday. So yesterday, we had expectations. Yesterday, we wondered how are we going to get through this, whatever it is. And today, we've marshaled those to think about tomorrow. Tomorrow, ideally, and tomorrow, really. So these questions 
do we understand where we really are? And do we understand where we really came from? And if we understand that as an individual, are we joining with others so that they share that understanding and that view of ideal and real? Okay. And so Heil Bronner said, the concepts, these many concepts of the future turn into actions in the present. And those actions in the present, as they evolve, become history. So the future, the concepts of the future turn into history in our lived experience. As you can see, everybody who thinks this way loses their hair. Ha ha ha. That's just a joke. Um, that's, that's Bob Heilbronner. He was a professor at Harvard. He was a truly great not only was he a great economist, he was a great writer. And if you've ever had the drudgery of reading economics, you know that that doesn't happen very often, that you get a great economist who is also a great writer. Um, and he reflected on changes in the economy and in the social world so that he could understand all steps in the process of evolution. He was really a, a fascinating guy, great writing. And I do recommend if you if you are interested, I've got a copy of the book, but you can usually go on a used book website and find it. And uh, so what what did he what did he really talk about? The shared views, the views that we understand as coming from all of us are the strongest basis for creating that ideal sense or living with the real sense. And that new present, that new present, which was yesterday's future, becomes sustainable in a social and cultural and popular context. So if you don't have shared views at the start, your future might not be sustainable. And that gets into, no surprise, human conflict, which you want to avoid. Philosophy of History 101. How many philosophy majors in the room today? Okay, so we're going to make this really short there is doing history and there is living history. So there's descriptive philosophy of history and there is speculative philosophy of history. This is probably why none of you were philosophy majors. But let me just say, doing history is the physical act of going out and doing research and pulling stuff out of libraries or finding documents that nobody else has found, reading and understanding them, and then compiling them into a colligatory concept, which turns into a magisterial work of history, an authoritative work of history, whether that's about 900 years ago or about natural history 9,000 years ago or about what happened five years ago. That's the physical doing of history. That's what historians do, their professional work. That's descriptive philosophy of history. Speculative philosophy of history really came on after the Industrial Revolution because there were infinite possibilities for the future. No, Things had been so much the same for so long before the Industrial Revolution that people didn't expect things to change. But with the Industrial Revolution, there began to be many different possibilities for a future, and speculative philosophy of history is about the actual lived history of people. Now, Heilbronner brilliantly goes back and forth between both of these, and he really focuses on our ability to understand both doing history and living history in 
a social and societal context. So he gives us enormous insights, which I recommend to you. And so now into the actual process, construction. We're going to build a hotel, folks. So what are the elements we've got to have for the hotel? You already know there's got to be a developer who's got the money. There's got to be a sense of what the hotel is for. They call that programming in the architecture business. Then there's got to be an actual architecture or designer, and that's the design phase. And that turns into what we call shop drawings. And then your next step goes into actual construction. And then finally, when, before everybody comes in for a nice evening like this, the commissioning agents come and they turn on every system in the hotel to see if each one works individually and if they all work together. So that's construction 101. And that's also creating history and a future 101. Those commissioning agents are us living with the result and seeing what has been done through the shared expectations, the plans that we all come up with, whether they're actual written plans or evolutionary actions that together form an unwritten plan. And those actions are in history, they're, they're lived, and they result in a final historical product. So at the base, when we do our hotel, who do we have? We've got the developer. We've got the, the brand here. This is an Accor hotel. So somebody comes from Paris. They're the brand. And then you've got your architect designer and you've got your engineer who says I, the, the beams have got to hold up this much weight. And you've got somebody from the city planning department, somebody who knows the zoning and what it takes to put the hotel into the middle of the city. All of them are working here in the present with shared understandings. And they're creating a shared expectation of what's going on. And they work as a team, no surprise. And that is how they get to their result. What that means is that I started with the new the new being how we're going to talk to Gen Z TV sports viewers or any of the topics you're going to hear tonight. And one of the crucial insights Heilbrunner comes up with is that the future is not taking care of itself somewhere off in the misty beyond. The new is now. It's not tomorrow. It is taxing. It is demanding. It's requiring a lot of us here in the present that keeps us focused on not just our mastery of the subject matter, but our ability to understand everyone's interest and everybody's mastery of the subject matter being both the present and the past and the ideal and the real futures. So new becomes now, and now is affected by forces, forces like AI, forces like money, forces like power, and public opinion. You can't have a situation where there's a general conversation about making things better, about provoking change, the subject of our evening here, without there being some concern over stasis, actually, it's always been done this way. We're in a straitjacket, and we're never going to get people to move out of that straitjacket, or even anger over what type, how close we're going to get to the ideal and why we're falling down to the real. So these forces have to be identified as part of the context within which we are attempting to set up our future, our new. So what then is our role? What then is my role, your role, all of us? We are required by the seriousness of tomorrow, the seriousness of the future, to understand 
to to listen, to respect, to be honest about our interests and about our understanding of the present and the recent past, so that in our context, if it's in a company, if it's in a university, if it's in a city, if it's in a country, if it's a region, or if it's, you know, something even bigger, if we all end up at the United Nations, that we are clear about the present that we occupy, how it resulted from the past, and what becomes the ideal future, and what might be the real future. So are we going to be effective in this in this task? Are we going to succeed in building the great hotel, building the building that stands up and that makes money so that everybody can get paid? And we're only going to get there if we have rigor in understanding our present and if we have clarity in seeing what we all agree is needed in the future. And if we practice that respect for individuals and the people who they represent so that we can have a correct understanding. Because on the other end of this, there is another reality that that never goes away. Our future becomes our history. So when I said at the beginning, whose future as our, it's our future that becomes our history. So we're dealing with something that will affect each one of us. It will be there for each of us, for our kids, for our grandchildren. And so we will get it wrong sometimes. We will get it right sometimes. We want to get it right more than we get it wrong. But one way we get it wrong is to ignore the requirements of working together and understanding who we are, what are our shared expectations, how did we get here, what was it that brought us here, and where are we going in terms of ideal or, we hope, real that's close to the ideal. Folks, it's really a privilege to speak with all of you. I'm sorry that I didn't ask you more questions. Did anybody get anything out of that talk? Let me see. How many, how many, did anybody, come on, show of hands. Rotary left, but uh, all right, all right. Folks, lady, thank you very much. Thanks for coming.